First slide, please. My friends, the objects of our campaign, the deserving poor. Next. The industrious poor. Next. The poor with the moral resolution and strength of spirit to pull themselves out of the morass. These people, our people, need only the guiding light of knowledge and inspiration to set them on their road. And, my dear friends, to provide that light, that is not merely our Christian duty, it is our privilege. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr Matthew Crosby. Oh. The Tragedy of Hanbury Street by Bert Cools with Clive Medicine as Sherlock Holmes and Andrew Sachs as Dr. John Watson and featuring Lindsay Duncan as Mrs. Adams and Colette O'Neill as Miss Wallace. The Tragedy of Hanbury Street. It was a better day today. No fights. No real drunks, and only a few knife wounds. And Jonathan says that the abandoned baby will live. I held her in my arms. She was so light. Jonathan said we should call her Charlotte, since it was I who found her. But I think we should call her Hope. Charlotte! Charlotte, come on now. Charlotte! Any sign? Rachel Gaddle. What does she think she's playing at? I should have followed her when she ran out. I was busy. We're all busy. Jonathan, what on earth did you say to her? Doctor! Uh, Miss Wallace! Have you found this stupid child? Dr Crosby, you'd better come. Dear God. This stupid, stupid little girl. Help me get her down. How old was your daughter, Mrs. Adams? Sixteen, Doctor. And you'd no objection to her working at the clinic? It is our Christian duty to succour the poor and the sick. But Hanbury Street, even by Whitechapel standards, that's a rough area. The place is well supervised. And frankly, I thought she'd get tired of the whole thing inside a week. And when she didn't? It would have been merely a matter of time. Charlotte was given to... whims. What does she use? A scarf, Mr. Holmes. Tied to a hook in the ceiling. They say the room used to be a cold store. For meat. And this happened on the 10th? Three days ago. The 10th, yes. And you've no idea what drove her to such a desperate act? That's why I've come here. You understand, of course, that I might not be successful. Yes, I realise that. There is also another possibility. You might discover something about my daughter which I would not wish to hear. Exactly so. I don't care. I won't be able to rest until I know the truth. You're a very brave woman, Mrs Adams. No, Doctor. Not brave. Not one little bit. Mr Holmes, you should see this. They found this clutched in Charlotte's hand. Thank you. Does it mean anything to you? Nothing. Hmm. What? Oh, thank you. Forgive me. I didn't know. I didn't know. Had you heard of this Crosby Clinic? No, but I imagine it's typical of its type. Full of good intentions, but providing little more than a drop in the ocean. A well, drop's better than nothing. Well, there are those who resent even that much. One establishment of the sort was burned down in 79. Oh, why, for God's sake? Well, because his clientele offended the morals of the arsonist. He turned out to be the local vicar. <laughs> a young woman volunteer leaves home happy and contented, and a few hours later, she, she takes her own life. What in God's name could have happened? Why didn't we drive right up to the door? I wanted to observe without being observed. Oh. Ah. What are your impressions? 
Well, it's just a rambling old house. Well, I think we can go a little further than that. The building used to be a rooming house, but fell into ruin a good few years ago and was boarded up. And it changed hands and money was spent to make it habitable. Well, it looks as though it could do with some more. Yes, the Crosby Clinic's evidently seen better days. I wonder who Crosby is. Let's find out. Frederick Crosby, gentlemen. He was born in this house. There were 32 separate families living here then, if you can call it living. You can still find the same thing today, God help us. Mr Crosby evidently escaped from his poverty. An example to us all, Mr Holmes. He rose by his own efforts, bought the building and established the clinic. Free medicine, hot food, warm clothing and sucker for the soul. That was 20 years ago. Is he still involved? He passed away nine years later. But his work continues. His son, Dr Jonathan Crosby, is in charge now. And exactly what is your position? I look after the day-to-day -day running of the establishment. Tell me about Charlotte Adams. There's very little to tell. She'd been a volunteer here for just over three months. Uh, do you have many helpers that young? We are grateful for anyone who'll give us that time, Doctor. She had her mother's permission. Was she a good worker? I believe so. She spent most of her time assisting Dr Crosby in the surgery. I shall need to speak to him. I'm afraid that's not possible. Why not? Because he's not here at the moment. Our Dr Kelly's helping out. He comes in from time to time. Where is Dr Crosby? Occupied with a personal family matter. But I can tell you anything you need to know. Dr Crosby told me that Charlotte suddenly just ran out of the surgery. Up to that moment he'd noticed nothing out of the ordinary about her. Do you know what they were doing? What sort of patient they were treating? I asked him that, of course. He said it was a purely routine case. Nothing that could have upset or distressed her. Mr Holmes, Charlotte Adams was made of sterner stuff than that. We do quite a few amputations here. Ah. Did Dr Crosby follow her? He was too busy. But later we realised that she hadn't been seen for some time. And you mounted a search? That sounds a little grand. We looked around for her and found her in there. Yeah. Do you have any idea what could have driven her to take her own life? All I know is this. Whatever it was, it had nothing whatsoever to do with my clinic. I'll be downstairs in my office if you should need me. Gentlemen? Oh, Miss Wallace? My clinic. Hmm. Interesting choice of words. Hmm. Now. Oh, what a dismal little room. Why here? Well, as the mother said, the, uh, the hooks in the ceiling. Well, stay here for a moment, would you? Oh, yes, of course. So I doubt if there's anything still to read after two days, but you never know. Yes, yes. Ah, yes, you can come in now. Have you found anything? Well, no, not much. Uh, she used this chair. Uh, first to secure her scarf, uh, like so. And then to uh, position herself, yes. A moment of stillness. Have you observed how the prospect of imminent death quietens the mind? And then... It's a mistake to believe that the young can't feel the anguish and the darkness of their elders. What terrible burden drove her to such a measure? There's nothing more to be learned here. Well, I um, I talked to the doctor, uh, Dr. Kelly. Hmm? What's he like? Uh, elderly, a bit shaky. Retired from general practice a few years ago. Doing his best under the circumstances. Well, what do you mean? It's not just the building that needs money. They're using patched up equipment, makeshift supplies, and treatments out of the ark. Hmm. What was his opinion of the girl? Quiet, serious, very pleasant, interested in his work. She told him she wanted to be a doctor. Oh, that sounds like rather more than a whim. Does he have any idea why she did it? No, he said not. And you believed him? Yes, I did. 
How did you get on with the volunteers? Well, everyone told the same story. She was hard-working, uh, dedicated. If she wanted to become a doctor, she'd have needed to be. So, we know she had a strong desire to help her fellow man. Hmm. Well, highly commendable, as long as it's not taken to extremes. Holmes, 16 years old is an age of extremes. It's an age when you want to change the world. And when the smallest thing can assume a significance out of all proportion to reality. Well, Mr. Holmes, what did you learn at the clinic? Nothing of significance, I'm afraid. Uh, but uh, we haven't yet spoken to everyone. Mrs. Adams, just how much time did your daughter spend at Hanbury Street? She was there almost every day. And the rest of the time? She stayed here at home, reading mostly. She loved to read, anything with print on it. Did she have many friends? My daughter was a quiet girl. She wasn't given to socialising. Mm. She wasn't um, walking out with anybody. She was too young for such things. So, apart from yourself and the people at the clinic, Charlotte had very little contact with anybody else. Where is her bedroom? Ah, oh, there's nothing here. The room's practically been emptied. It's a common enough reaction to a bereavement. You either find this or the opposite. Everything left exactly as it was. Well, a shrine would have been highly informative. This is like a slate that's been wiped clean. What are you looking for? A uh, diary. In my admittedly limited experience, most solitary young ladies can be relied upon to unburden themselves in a diary. You find it and it could crack this case wide open. Perhaps her mother's already found it. Yes, then why hasn't she mentioned it to us? Uh, 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 this is useless. Nothing behind the furniture, nothing out of the rugs, and no hiding places in the walls. Maybe she simply didn't keep a diary. Begging your pardon, sirs. But she did. Ha! And where is it now? Well, I, d I don't know. Um, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry, sir. Oh, don't worry, Alice. It's all right. Yes, sir. No, please, please, don't be scared. No, sir. Where's the other gentleman? He's talking to your mistress. He thought you might be more comfortable with just one of us. Mm. <laughs> Between you and me, he can be a bit frightening sometimes. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, Alice, it's all right for you to talk to me. Mrs Adams won't be angry. I, I shouldn't have brought you below stairs, sir. Oh, I like it here. Oh, yeah, upstairs is too um, stuffy, don't you think so? Well, I've never heard a gentleman say that before. You should see where I live, Alice. Not stuffy at all. <laughs> Miss Charlotte liked it down here. Yes. She she liked your scullery, did she? Oh, yes, sir. Mm. Did she come down here to see you? When her mum... When the mistress was out. We used to talk down here. Ah. Oh. She, she said... Well, it, well, go on, Alice. What, what did she say? She said we was friends. Ah. I, t I told her no, I wasn't allowed to be her friend. But she just laughed and said that was old-fashioned talk and one time soon everything would be different. Is that true, sir? It was all right for me to be her friend. I think it was a very good thing. Oh, I'm so pleased. Mrs Adams, I must ask you about the day your daughter died. Of course you must. It's good of you to be concerned about my feelings, Mr. Holmes, but I'll not collapse in tears. I may not be myself at present, but I'm made of sterner stuff than that. <laughs> Miss Wallace used exactly the same phrase about your daughter. She did? Hmm. When Charlotte left the house, did she appear at all upset or distracted? I've already told you, no, not at all. No, she said nothing to you about something that was troubling her? Nothing. Now, if there had been something wrong, would she have mentioned it? Not necessarily. Not even to you? Mr. Holmes, it's evident that you're not a family man. However close they might be, 16 years old is not an age at which a young woman confides in her mother. Alice, tell me this. Do you know what made your friend Charlotte do what she did? No, sir, I don't. Well, I wish so much that I did. I want to understand it more than anything. And I, I want to be able to tell Mrs. Adams, too. I, I hear her crying, you know, oh. when she thinks no-one's there. 
breaks my heart, sir. Well, perhaps between the two of us we can help find out. I'd like that, sir. Good girl. Did Miss Charlotte ever talk to you about the clinic, uh, about the people there? Oh, yes, sir. Well, she loved that place she did. She told me once she found a little baby what nearly died, but they saved it. Oh. Oh, she was so happy. <laughs> did she ever talk about a gentleman called Crosby, Dr Jonathan Crosby? Oh, yes, sir. All the time. And what did she say? Well, I think... Well, well, go on, Alice. I want to know what you think. Oh, sir, I think she really liked him. Did you approve of Charlotte's ambition to become a doctor? A doctor? You didn't know? A doctor. Mr Holmes, last year it was an artist and six months before that it was a lawyer. Well, thank you very much, Alice. I'll tell your mistress how helpful you've been. Sir? Yes, what is it? Well, Miss Charlotte did say something. Something I didn't understand. What was it? It was just a few days before... Well, you know. Go on. We was down here talking, only she was angry about something. Do you know what she was angry about? No, sir. She didn't say, and I didn't like to ask, but she was really angry, I could tell. And she said something which puzzled you? Well, she was talking to herself. I don't think she even knew I was here. She said, wait till he gets it. Over and over. Wait till he gets it. Wait till he gets it. What on earth can it mean? I don't know. But we're uh, gathering threads. Sooner or later, we'll find the one thing that'll bring them all together. So, what next? Oh, I've done enough running around for one day. It's time for some dinner and some thought. And tomorrow morning... Back to Hanbury Street? Well, we talk to Dr Jonathan Crosby. Uh, try ringing again. Yes. What was it Miss Wallace said? Uh, that he was occupied with a personal family matter. Yeah, this could mean almost anything. Uh, even assuming that it's true. We think she was lying. <laughs> uh, gentlemen? Uh, we wish to speak to Dr Jonathan Crosby. It's my card. I'm sorry, Mr Holmes, but I'm afraid that is not possible. Well, when will it become possible? Never, sir. At ten o'clock yesterday evening, Dr. Crosby took his own life. Well, what did they say? Pistol to the temple. He was dead by the time they got him here. Damn the man. Why couldn't he have waited? Oh. There's something else. Hmm? What? I asked if they knew why he'd done it. The surgeon was surprised. That you were interested? That I needed to inquire. Apparently the butler volunteered the information to the ambulance men. Dr. Crosby had been severely depressed following the death of his brother. Another death, another Crosby. Yes. Did this informative surgeon know when he died, this brother? Very recently, on the 8th. Two days before Charlotte Adams. Uh, mm -hmm. Ah, here it is. Mm, what does it say? Uh, Tragic death of prominent city banker, Mr Matthew Gordon Crosby was found dead in his bed at his London home on Tuesday morning, having suffered a massive hemorrhage while he slept. Mr Crosby will doubtless be remembered by our readers for his tireless efforts to bring education and enlightenment to the less well-favoured portions of the capital's population. Another philanthropist. Mm, seems to run in the family. But how can any of this possibly be connected with Charlotte Adams? Jonathan Crosby's brother dies. Two days later, the doctor's back at the clinic. Work as an antidote to sorrow? Yeah, rather a rapidly taken antidote, wouldn't you say? Well, everyone reacts to these things differently. Well, whatever his motive, he's back in his surgery, and assisting him is Charlotte Adams. Sixteen, idealistic, ambitious. And very fond of him? Well, what would that mean? She'd be upset on his behalf. Uh, assuming she knew about his loss. That's a good point. Perhaps it was then that he told her. And she was so distraught that she ran from the room and killed herself. I wasn't suggesting that. Yes, even for a 16-year-old female, that's taking an emotional reaction rather too far. But something happened. I suppose we should consider the possibility... Yes? Uh, 
well, you have a man in emotional turmoil and a sympathetic and attractive young woman. And he might have turned to her for some consolation. And she might have misinterpreted his meaning. This is not a pleasant thought, but it, it is possible. I refuse to countenance the idea. Jonathan Crosby saw the Adams girl as an intelligent child. No more than that. Besides which, they were treating a patient when she suddenly ran from the room. The whole notion is preposterous. Did Dr Crosby strike he was being particularly upset that day? His only brother had just died, Mr Holmes. And yet he was here, as usual. The work doesn't go away just because we have problems of our own. Gentlemen, I am extremely busy. Is there anything else? Was Dr Crosby close to his brother? Certainly. Did Matthew Crosby ever come here? On occasion, I believe. Because of his own interest in aiding the disadvantaged? No doubt. Now, if you'll excuse me... Why didn't you mention Dr Crosby's suicide? I wanted to see if she'd mention it first. Would she know already? There's been ample time for a message to arrive. But if she's heard, why didn't she tell us? She couldn't know we've already discovered it for ourselves. And she must realise it might be relevant. Uh, I rather think Miss Wallace has her own ideas about what is and isn't relevant. What? What the devil? Oh, you fool! Don't let me make it work! Take your hands off of me! <laughs> Kelly, I'm all right. Help him. Do keep away from no, me. No, no, no. Calm, calm down. That's a nasty-looking knife. You must be in agony. Keep away. I tried to take it out. Our friend here had objected. That's because it's a Romanish shiv. The blade's been barbed at the tip. Stay where you are. Don't be a fool. I can help you. Holmes, whatever you say. Now. Keep his arm still. I've got it. Let go of me! No! Oh, 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 no, I'm, I'm all right. Somebody give me a scalpel. Now! Right. This this is going to hurt a little. And so is this. There. That's got it. Uh, you can stop struggling now. It's over. You cut me, you bastard. And that's quite enough of that. I had to clear the flesh away from the blade. It was either that or push the whole knife through to the other side of your arm. Perhaps you'd have preferred that. Oh, Did he hurt you? Uh, I've had worse. It's a nice atmosphere for a 16-year-old girl. Damn ruffian. Mm. He was a perfectly respectable market porter till he took to drink. Mm. I'm glad you took the time to notice that while he was beating the living daylights out of me. Now, oh, really, Doctor, don't exaggerate. Uh, it was interesting to see inside that surgery. Ah, you saw what I meant about the state of things. Yes, of course, but that wasn't exactly my principal concern. Everything hinges on what happened in that room. When Crosby and Charlotte were alone together. Not alone. Huh? Oh, no, that's right. They had a patient with them. If we could find out who it was. Oh, I don't think there's much chance of that. They don't keep any records. And the patients are in and out of there like flies. I doubt if any of the volunteers would remember. It wasn't the volunteers I was thinking of asking. Soup now, do we? That's right, love over here. You stick with me. <laughs> Why didn't you just talk to the patients while we were there? It could have helped. Well, we've learnt nothing. We were well dressed, well fed, and strangers. The the enemy. Uh, I suppose you're right. Oh, that's better. So, did you learn anything? I had to work my way through several lunch companions, but eventually I found a regular customer. And as luck would have it, she'd been waiting just outside the surgery when the late Miss Adams rushed past her, looking like she'd seen a ghost, apparently. Did this woman see what happened? No, but she was able to tell me who was actually in with them at the time. You have the name? I have rather more than that. All right, all right, three cards. Three cards and no more cards. Two of them is aces and one's the lady. You know what you've got to do. Here she is and there she was. And round and round they go. Put your penny on the lady, I'll give you back six. Can't say fairer than that now, can I? No, he's ever, no, he's ever, he's ever, he's ever. A sovereign on this one. 
Where the hell do you come by that sort of money? Yeah, we'll set to you. Are we playing or not? Yeah, I'll tell, I'll tell you what. If you win, you keep the sovereign. If I oh, win, ain't got no if six I sobs. win, you let me buy you a drink, eh? Let's take a look, shall we? Yeah. Hey! Well, well, it must be my lucky day. Oh, good elf to you, whoever the hell you are. Yeah, good elf. Oh, oh that's good, that is. I'm pleased to hear it. Uh -huh. All right. That's enough games. What do you want? He went to the clinic because his hand had swollen up. He kept dropping his cars, which didn't do his business much good. And he was there when Charlotte Adams suddenly ran out. Oh, yes, he remembers it vividly. Well, what happened? Crosby was draining the blood from his hand with a couple of leeches and explaining about them to the girl. It's common gossip at the clinic that he was teaching her basic medicine, something else Miss Wallace omitted to mention. Well, there's no reason why that should have upset her. If she assisted at amputations, a bloodletting's nothing. The conversation moved on to Crosby's brother. Ah, well, that sounds rather more interesting. You were right. She hadn't heard the sad news. And Crosby told her. Was that what did it? He told her. She was shaken, yes, but no more than that. Well, then. And then she asked what he died of. Was natural enough. And? And Jonathan Crosby told her, and it was that one piece of information which sent Charlotte Adams running straight to her death. You don't object to a spot of mild deception? Not at all. I've been thinking about this anyway. And if it'll help the case? I think it will. Hmm. You're a natural confidant, Watson, especially where the fair sex is concerned. Uh, what will you be up to? Uh, a little light reading. Good luck. Mm, there. Dissolve this in water and drink it straight down. It should help. Oh, thanks, Doc. Oh, who's next? Uh, Mrs Quilly? Doctor? Wheel in the next patient, would you? Oh, there's no one waiting, Doctor. Good grief. You mean I get a chance to sit down? I expect you could do with a nice cup of tea. Ah, oh, Mrs Quilly, you're a lifesaver. There you are, sir. Excellent. Just let me know when you're ready for the next volume. Yes, thank you. Hmm. Oh, that's very good. Thank you. Enjoy it while you can, Doctor. They'll be pouring in again before you know it. Yes, so Dr Kelly said. This is so good of you. The poor man needs a rest, God knows. Oh, it's my pleasure. Good to be back in harness again. <laughs> How long have you been a volunteer here, Mrs Quilly? Nearly 12 years. Oh, I imagine you've seen some changes. I certainly have. I remember when we didn't have to scrimp and save quite so much for one thing. What happened, do you know? I don't really understand these things. My husband says it's down to the stock market. Ah. Oh. Your founder might have been a saint, but he had no idea about making money. That's what my husband says. And I suppose that young Dr Crosby was the same, God rest his soul. But the old place keeps on going somehow. Thank heaven for it. Amen to that. Dr Watson. Yes? Why aren't... Earth would Dr. Crosby do such a thing? I simply can't understand it. I don't know, Mrs. Quilly. Depression can do strange things. Depression? I had a brother who died. We weren't really on good terms, but I still felt, um. Uh, it must have been terrible for Dr. Crosby. What do you mean? Well, being so close to his brother like that. Oh, Doctor, I don't know who you've been talking to, but Jonathan Crosby and his brother weren't what you might call close. They hated the sight of each other. Not only were they daggers drawn, everyone at the clinic knew it. There'd been a stand-up row in full view of volunteers, patients, everyone. Mm, so much of Miss Wallace's firm statement to the contrary. You said from the first she was lying to us. What was the row about? I'm afraid the details are a little hazy, though money seems to have been at the heart of it. Yes, that makes sense. But Mrs Quilly was quite certain of one thing. Jonathan accused his brother of, and I quote exactly, mm. of wanting to bleed this place dry. Ah, vital link in the chain. But what does it mean? 
Tell me, did Charlotte Adams observe this fight? Yes. I'm afraid she saw the whole thing. This case keeps throwing up little snippets of vital information that no one seems so bothered to tell us. Such as? Such as that both Crosby brothers lived in this house, not just Dr. Jonathan. How did you find that out? I spent the day in a newspaper library reading up on Matthew Crosby and his charitable pursuits, and then I had a quiet word with a grateful ex-client in Chancery Lane. The late Mr. Crosby's legal activities have been quite the talk of the Inns of Court. Ah, good afternoon, Treves. Uh, Mr. Holmes, Doctor, may I ask why you're here? Because it's essential that I see inside this house. I'm sorry, Mr. Holmes, I have no authority to admit you. I say again, it's essential. For what reason? I'm acting on behalf of Mrs. Margaret Adams. Her daughter was a volunteer at the Crosby Clinic. I believe I've heard Dr. Crosby mention the young lady, sir. Well, then you'd be sorry to hear that she's dead. Well, very sorry indeed, And that sir. both of your late employers might well be implicated. Now, may we come in? Who discovered Matthew Crosby's body? I did, sir. When I brought his morning tea to his bedroom. In here, gentlemen. He died in his sleep? Yes, sir. What condition was he in when you found him? He was lying quite normally. I'd have thought he was asleep if it hadn't been for the blood. What was the source of the bleeding? His nose and ears, sir. Cranial hemorrhage. I believe that's what the doctors said, yes, sir. I want to see all the posts from the last seven days. I think this is everything, Mr. Holmes. Has anything been thrown out? No, sir. With the house in such disarray. It's excellent, excellent. There yeah, won't be a letter, a parcel. What are you looking for? Ah, this. Addressed to Matthew. It's unwrapped, but most of the label still attached. No postmark. Uh, Treves, do you recall when this arrived? I'm afraid not, Mr. Holmes. Yeah, but it was Matthew Crosby who opened it. No one else would have done so, sir. No, very good, very good. Wait till he gets it. Watson, take a look. If I'm right, this package contains the clue to three deaths. What on earth is in it? Well, I have my suspicions. Let's find out if they're correct. Good Lord. And so the case is complete. Please, uh, take a seat, Mrs. Adams. Thank you, Doctor. Yes, it's, uh, it's good of you to come here. I know it can't have been easy for you. <clears throat> Mr. Holmes, I hope this isn't going to take long. Miss Wallace, from the very beginning of this investigation, you have done everything in your power to stand in my way. How dare you, sir? And now you will have the courtesy to grant me your time. Very well. But if you have something to see, sir, then see it. Thank you. The most important element in this case, and one of the key facts which you have striven to conceal from me, is that until very recently... The whole future of this clinic was in doubt. I don't know what you're talking about. Kindly do not insult my intelligence. This is what I'm talking about. The festering infection of the East End slums will never be eradicated while well-intentioned but dangerously misguided do-gooders insist on soothing the ills of drunken sots and filling the stomachs of common whores so they can go back onto the streets and continue to spread their corruption. What a terrible sentiment. All the more terrible considering its source. What do you mean, Doctor? That was an extract from a speech given by Mr Matthew Crosby. Clearly, his charitable instincts had some very well-defined boundaries. He was attacking his own father's work. Many misguided people have done so, Mr Holmes. But no others have taken quite such extreme steps. He was planning to seize control of this clinic, sell the building and reinvest the fund, and then use the proceeds for his own purpose. A grand educational institute for the population of the district. Except, of course, those the enlightened Mr. Crosby deemed unacceptable. Do you seriously suppose that any of my people would be allowed to put a toe over the threshold? Yes, you knew all about his scheme. So did Dr. Jonathan Crosby. And so, tragically, did Charlotte Adams. She heard the brothers arguing. She realised what Matthew Crosby was planning to do. And she decided to show him that it wasn't only his brother who objected to his attitude. She sent him this. 
Mrs. Adams, I believe you'll recognize your daughter's hand on what's left of the label. Yes. Yes, that's her writing. What is in the box? She wanted to make her point as forcibly as she could. And she had the materials to hand, amongst the antiquated supplies in the surgery where she worked. She heard Jonathan accuse Matthew of wanting to bleed this place dry. And so she sent him these. Take a close look, Miss Wallace. And now you, Mrs. Adams. Oh, dear God. Are they dead? They are. But your reaction's understandable. Dead or alive, a box full of leeches isn't a pleasant sight. Unless, of course, you're expecting to see it. Isn't that so, Miss Wallace? I can't believe it. Charlotte did that. Your daughter's work here wasn't a whim or a passing fad. She believed in this place with all her heart and soul. And Matthew Crosby was threatening its very survival. Sending that package was an empty, childish gesture, but it did have the virtue of making her point with admirable directness. Very well, very well. My daughter made a silly, futile protest. At least she took a stand. I'm proud of her for that. But, Mr Holmes, what has this to do with her suicide? Events took a turn which changed everything. Matthew Crosby died. Charlotte learned the news from his brother, and not unnaturally, she was considerably shaken. She asked exactly what had happened. And was given the devastating news that he'd suffered from haemophilia. I'm sorry, I don't understand. I'm afraid it's all too simple. Your daughter thought she was a murderess. In her mind, she saw Crosby reach into the box... The leeches fasten onto his skin, the blood-sucking begin. She'd seen it often enough in the surgery here, and more. She'd seen some patients pass out as the leeches did their work. She pictured Crosby unconscious on the floor as the bloated leeches removed themselves and the bite wounds continued to bleed. Unstoppable and fatal. There are few adults who could live with that image haunting them. And for all her intelligence and maturity, your daughter was still only a 16-year-old girl. Forgive me, I didn't know. She didn't know about his haemophilia. She didn't know that her gesture of defiance was deadly to him. She had dedicated her life to helping other people and healing the sick, and now she was convinced that she'd killed a man. And she couldn't live with that guilt. And you? What about me, Mr. Holmes? You knew this. You knew the whole story. Do you deny it? I found this in with Charlotte's things. It's a diary. It's all in here. You've had that the whole time. And told no one... What were you thinking? Were you trying to protect me? No, Mrs. Adams, not you. I hoped you'd find nothing. The girl's death would be put down to hysteria and the whole thing just blow over. How could you do it? How? Why do you need to ask? I did it for the clinic. Your daughter wasn't the only one who loved this place. Mr. Holmes. Mrs. Adams. You said that Charlotte thought she was a murderess. Yes, I did. Then she was mistaken. She was. You're sure of that? Completely sure? He died in his sleep. The package had been opened long before. Charlotte was not in any way responsible for Matthew Crosby's fate. Thank you, sir. Miss Wallace. Mrs Adams. The diary, if you please. Thank you. I believe it's time I got to know my daughter. Oh, what a terrible affair. Well, at least the clinic is safe. Hmm. Might be rather more than that. Oh? 
Mm, fresh look at those investments could well improve things. Good. That would be good. You know, I've been thinking about Jonathan Crosby. Indeed. I still don't understand why he put a pistol to his head. Well, I suspect it was guilt. Because of what he told Charlotte Adams? Oh, surely not. Even if he knew about her sending the leeches. Miss Wallace confessed to telling him. He knew. Yes, all right, but to kill himself over an innocent, casual comment. Well, it was rather more than that. If his brother hadn't died, Charlotte Adams would still be alive. But he couldn't have done anything to prevent Matthew's death. Well, certainly he could. He could have refrained from killing him. Uh, 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 Jonathan Crosby murdered Matthew? His father's work was being threatened. His work, too. And a fatal hemorrhage is remarkably easy to induce if you happen to be a doctor. And he just stood there and watched while his own brother bled to death. Well, we don't know that he watched. Well, that's hardly the point. Good Lord. Will you tell the police? Tell them what? That Jonathan Crosby was a murderer. Was he? Well, you... you just said so. Well, well Watson, all I did was outline a theory. Nothing more. A theory? There's no proof? Well, none that I'm aware of. Uh... You? Of course not. Matthew Crosby died of natural causes, and his brother couldn't live with the loss. Charlotte Adams killed herself over a tragic misunderstanding, and the clinic will continue its work, untainted by scandal. It's a good enough ending, as endings go. Why change it? I've sent the package. I have no illusions that it will make any difference. But at least I've done something. The clinic must not close. Too many lives depend on it. Too much love and dedication has been poured into it. <laughs> I suppose it was a silly, nasty thing to do. But sometimes in life one must do terrible things for what one believes in. The clinic has been so good to me. It's wonderful to be part of something so worthwhile and so needed. I found my purpose here. My future. I've never felt so alive. In The Tragedy of Hanbury Street, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicine and Dr John Watson by Andrew Sachs. Mrs. Adams was played by Lindsay Duncan and Miss Wallace by Colette O'Neill. Charlotte Adams was played by Lydia Leonard, Matthew Crosby by John Rowe, Jonathan Crosby by Chris Moran, Treves by Philip Fox, and Mrs. Quilly by Francis Jeter. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The violinist was Leonard Friedman. The Tragedy of Hanbury Street was written by Bert Coules, from a reference in the short story The Golden Pince-Nez by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The director was Patrick Rayner. <laughs>